Hello, and welcome to the Brave Traveler podcast, episode four, for fans of the supernatural, tales of fantasy, and adventure. Welcome back. A quick fun fact about the story. As I was telling it to my sons, I asked them to come up with a name for the wizard. My four-year-old came up with something like poopy guy or something. I told him I didn't think that was going to work. My seven-year-old, however, said, how about Gilzuin? I asked him, where'd you get that? And he said, I made it up. Gilzuin it was. When I started writing the story, I thought I'd do a Google search and I typed in Gilzuin and the word joylessness popped up for some reason. Creepy, but perfect. So I used it in the story. As for the name of the goblin, you can find it on your keyboard. No, the goblin's name is not Tab. Before we continue, if you like this content, please subscribe, hit the notification button, tell the like button to wake up, and let's go, because I got some reading to do. Episode 4, Majesty, the Sorcerer and the Saint. Chapter 3, The Chase. When Katie stepped into the light, she was standing at the edge of a field with a large wooden fence behind her. A white three-railed fence with posts ten feet apart that ran the length of the open field. Beyond it was a narrow country road. She had seen this place before. It was the very same spot she had been to earlier that day. Only now she was standing on the other side of the fence with the huge green pasture stretching out in front of her. It was midday, and the sun was high in the sky. Katie walked under the shade of a tall oak, then blinked a few times to make sure she wasn't seeing things. There, in the distance, was the white horse, standing in the middle of the field, just as she remembered him. She stared silently. The horse was a good ways off, nearly fifty yards. With one step, then another, she started forward slowly and found herself tiptoeing through the grass as though she were having fun sneaking up on a mouse. Just then, the horse raised his head and looked right at her. She stopped and giggled, then crept forward again. If only she could get close enough to touch him, it was all she wanted. And then he bolted. With a few long strides, he doubled the distance and Katie yelled, Snowball, wait! Amazingly, the animal paused and turned to look back. The horse seemed to know its name. Katie laughed at the thought, but laughter turned to surprise when the horse reared up on its hind legs, then turned and galloped away. Wait! she cried again, then chased after him and watched the horse disappear in the row of trees at the edge of the clearing. She ran across the pasture without a care of what lay beyond the woods and quickly ducked inside the forest. She scurried around trees and hopped over tufts of tall grass, following the horse as it weaved its way through the woods up ahead. It was all she could do to keep sight of the beautiful animal, and even though she knew it was impossible to catch him, chasing after the horse was so much fun. Katie giggled as she ran and knew she had to be dreaming. She felt lighter than air with the wind in her face, her hair flowing behind her, and her slippers flitting through the blades of tall grass and barely seemed to touch the ground. On and on she went through the maze of trees, laughing and running, but no matter how fast she went, the white horse remained at a distance. When Katie finally paused to catch her breath, she looked back and saw there was no path or trail, only the thick woods all around her, and everything looked the same. Strangely, the white horse had stopped to look as well. Katie smiled at him. Surely he knew the way back to the big green pasture. There is no need to worry. All she had to do was keep him in sight. Suddenly the animal bolted again and was off in a flurry of leaves and a cloud of dust. Wait! Katie cried and ran on with the horse just ahead, never getting any closer or any further away. The white stallion ducked in and out of autumn trees that were suddenly filled with leaves of amber and scarlet. Katie kept running and hardly noticed that the trees were changing colors. Above her, gray clouds rolled across the sky, like a dark curtain slowly being drawn over the land. 
and as the light grew dimmer, the horse became strangely bright until he glistened like a jewel in the woods. Soon the forest was darkened, and the tall young trees were hunched over and stooped with age. They reached down with twisted branches, and when Katie finally thought to look, the lush green forest was filled with shadows, and all at once the old trees with their knotted limbs began to melt away until there were barely any trees left at all. When the horse finally stopped, Katie looked around with a growing fear, for everything was turned to night, and she was hopelessly lost. How could this be? Where had all the trees gone? she wondered, then turned to see the animal watching her and nodding its head up and down. It seemed to be beckoning her to follow, and for the first time Katie got the impression that the horse had not merely been running, but was actually leading her somewhere. She also sensed that in some strange way whatever he was leading her to was somehow responsible for all of this. The white horse turned and walked on, leading the way more slowly. Wait! Please wait! Where are you taking me? Katie's voice echoed into the night as she followed in earnest, looking around fearfully. The animal walked aimlessly across the hard and rocky ground that trailed off into the night, and Katie followed, trying to avoid the sharper stones beneath her feet. She spent most of her time looking down as she made her way forward, glancing up every now and then to make sure the horse was still there. She limped and stumbled in her fluffy little slippers and did her best to keep up. Then, when she was sure she could go no further, Katie looked, and to her surprise the horse had stopped. She stood there staring blankly. Was he lost? Perhaps it had come to its senses and was too afraid to venture any further. Yes, Katie thought to herself, that was it. Now it will turn around and go back, back to that beautiful green pasture. Waiting there in the cold gray darkness, Katie could only hope. She looked at the horse, and the horse looked back at her as though it had suddenly reached its destination, which appeared to be in the middle of nowhere. Katie just stared at the animal and wished she had never followed the white horse. I'm so stupid, Katie heard herself say, then paused when she realized it wasn't her voice. Indeed, she hadn't uttered a word, yet she could have sworn she heard something, a little squeaky voice that barely sounded human. All alone, are we? There it was again. Katie hesitated, then looked behind her. She saw no one and felt silly for even looking. All the stupid ones usually are. Alone, that is. Till you shot up, said the voice. Katie looked again, and again she saw no one. She looked all around and finally glanced down at her feet. There she found a fat little chipmunk sitting on the rocky ground next to her left bunny slipper. Katie jumped back when the chipmunk sat up, gave her a disapproving look, and folded its tiny arms across its furry chest. He tricked you too, eh? Katie didn't know what to think. Are you talking to me? she asked. I'd turn around if I were you. Coravandia is no place for the likes of you, nor for me for that matter. I beg your pardon, Katie said, not sure how she should properly address a chipmunk, especially a chipmunk that talked. The little creature looked off into the night with a thoughtful gaze. Joylessness, joylessness, he said, sounding very tired. Katie decided to stop talking and just let the little creature have its say. Joylessness is to blame. Joylessness has come to our land, and all was darkened. He is responsible for all this, you know. He is a curse to this place. Katie tried not to look too confused, but she couldn't help it. He? she said. Who? The chipmunk looked at her as though she were crazy. He who? He who? Joylessness! Joylessness! Haven't you been listening? He said. Katie drew back a little. I'm sorry, but I don't understand. You talk as though joylessness was a person. The tiny chipmunk looked at Katie and laughed. Ha! A person? A person, child? 
You have to have a heart to be a person. He's more of a monster than, than anything else. Gelzuin is his name, and he is joylessness himself. The chipmunk turned around and started to walk away. The throne's changed hands. It's all gone bad. He said, then called back over his shoulder. Don't say I didn't warn you. Katie just watched him and marveled as the little chipmunk padded off into the dark. But before he got too far, he stopped and stood up on his hind legs, then raised his arm and shook his tiny chipmunk fist in the direction of the white horse. Rogad, you're an evil, wicked sod, the chipmunk yelled out in a squeaky little voice, to which the horse snorted and shook its head defiantly. The chipmunk looked back at Katie. Beware of the great brown bear. He is out of sorts now that he has lost the throne. Then, with a courteous nod, the chipmunk started off again and disappeared into the darkness. Katie watched him go, then looked at the white horse, which she regarded with greater suspicion and doubt. In spite of the warning, she took a chance and stepped forward. The horse didn't move. She took another step, then another, and still the horse appeared unconcerned as she drew nearer. She wanted nothing more than to climb aboard the back of the animal and ride him out of the strange land. Again, it was this thought that kept her going. Soon she was closer than she had ever been, only ten yards away when she stopped again. She hadn't seen the huge rusted axe with its blade buried in the ground next to the animal. The tip of the enormous axe was firmly embedded in the rock and held the weapon with its handle pointed up in the air. She looked from the battered blade to the smooth ground beneath her feet. There were large gray stones carefully set into place all around her. There were even strange designs etched into their smooth surface. Katie started toward the horse once more. How odd, she thought, that these fine stones with their peculiar designs should be in the middle of nowhere with those great stone pillars. At least the jagged rocks were gone now, and she could walk more easily. Katie stopped and looked around in shock. Great stone pillars? Her eyes bulged wide. There were twelve enormous stone pillars, six on either side of her. Where had they come from? she wondered. They weren't there a minute ago. Were they? Maybe I just didn't see them. Impossible, she thought. Whatever the case, they were there now. She shook her head, feeling like she was going a little crazy, and kept her eyes wide open in case anything else should suddenly appear. And just then, something did. There was a terrible and loud creaking sound, the air-splitting noise of ancient iron hinges pleading to be oiled. Katie expected that such a terrible sound would surely frighten the white horse, but strangely enough the animal didn't even flinch and just stared at her with cold, dark eyes as an invisible door swung open in the empty space behind it. The bright orange glow covered Katie and lit the ground around her. It glared forth, and she shaded her eyes so she could see the open doorway that had suddenly appeared with its great stone entrance. Other things started to appear as reality shifted all around her, and Katie could hardly believe it when even the white horse began to change shape before her very eyes. The animal became darker, its smooth skin began to wrinkle and sprout warts. It reared up on its hind legs, which grew shorter and thicker, then hunched over like some terrible beast. Its neck shrunk down to a fat stump, and its forelegs became huge, hairy arms. Scraps of cloth, bits of armor and animal hide held together with leather straps were suddenly wrapped around and draped over the creature's body and before Katie could even begin to think, the transformation was complete. The horrible ogre, Rogad, reached down and drew his axe out of the stone which made the blade ring. He held the weapon in his massive fist and grinned. The creature was so big and ugly, it didn't matter that he was missing half of his teeth. Katie would have screamed if it weren't for the massive structure that was still appearing all around her. It loomed out of the darkness as though it had been there all along, 
hidden from view by some impossible source of magic. The dark castle walls stretched out on either side of her, while the castle towers seemed to go up and up, disappearing into the darkness. To the left and right of the great castle doors stood two stone giants, thirty feet tall. Their hulking forms held perfectly still and peered down at the child with dark, brooding faces that were chipped and cracked with age. The moss-covered statues were cold and lifeless, and Katie was thankful of that. When the veil of magic was lifted, she staggered back, her mind reeling in disbelief. The space around her was now a huge open courtyard surrounded by fortress walls, while high above dark creatures milled about and looked down from their sentry posts. Katie stared wide-eyed, trying to take it all in, then jumped when the ogre moved aside. Something was coming. Light surrounded the figure that appeared in the doorway of the castle, and Katie instantly knew that this was him, the one who was responsible for all of this. The man stood straight and tall and looked down with eyes as dark as the grave. He was draped in a long bronze robe, a lavish and regal garment that swept the ground when he walked. The material was thick and flecked with red speckles that shimmered like polished copper in the dim torchlight. His fur-lined collar covered his shoulders like a lion's mane and made him look grand and powerful. He came forward to get a better look at Katie, who stood there trembling. She watched him glance toward the sky, and when his steely gaze came to rest upon her once again, his lips curled into a devilish grin, and he spoke, How nice! How absolutely splendid! The mouse has followed the cheese. Welcome, Katie Campbell. I am Gelzuin, he said, with a voice that almost purred. Katie stood rooted to the spot. He knew her name, and as if that weren't bad enough, she knew his as well. When she realized where she had heard it, Katie jumped back, covered her mouth, and gasped. She hadn't recognized it when the chipmunk had said it, but now she was sure of it. It was the same name Jack had mentioned, the name on the sheet of paper, Gilzuin's Sorcery and House of Something or Other. She remembered thinking that the name was silly when she first heard it, and figured that whoever had made it up could have spent a little more time thinking of a better one. She had no idea that the name was real and had a real person attached to it, but as the chipmunk had warned her, this was not a person. This thing standing before her wasn't even human. One look and Katie knew that this was a wizard. He looked more like a wizard than anything possibly could. Perhaps it was his narrow eyebrows that were arched beyond belief, or the way he stood, poised for the moment, or his bedeviled smile. Katie couldn't tell what it was exactly, but knew he looked incredibly sly. Everything about him, even his sparkling teeth, looked sly, if not a little too pointy. He was tall, with hair as black as oil. Katie would have guessed he was in his forties, but in human years he was closer to five hundred and forty. Gold and lead beads braided into his hair showed that he was a wizard of great acclaim and a master above many. Katie tried to catch her breath as she gazed at the wizard. From the looks of things, Jack was right. Wizards were indeed real. She glanced over at the horrible ogre that was still glaring at her. It appeared that ogres were real as well, and now that she had seen it all, Katie wanted to run, but since her feet wouldn't move, she used what little courage she had to remain standing and tried not to shake. The traveling spell, she heard herself say, and was surprised that she could even make her mouth work under such horrible conditions. Yes, smiled the wizard. The spell is mine, he said, and turned away, with his robe billowing behind him, then shouted an order that made Katie jump. Bring her, he said. The horrible ogre came forward. It took huge steps, hunched over as its head lolled from side to side. The creature looked clumsy with its long arms banging against its knees. Katie watched him come closer and closer until he towered over her and his shadow covered her like an inescapable wave. Before she could move, 
the beast tossed his axe from one hand to the other, then reached out and grabbed her. Its thick, leathery fingers squeezed Katie's arm tightly and held her like a vice. She pulled, kicked, and struggled to break free, but only managed to flop around like a helpless doll. As the big, ugly monster brought her along, her feet skittering across the courtyard stones as he dragged her inside the castle. Chapter 4 Before Gelzuin's Throne Katie had no idea where the beast was taking her. All she could think about was the ogre's monstrous hand wrapped around her arm. The creature's skin felt like sandpaper that scratched her and made her wince as she staggered and stumbled behind him. Please, Katie cried, let me go. Rogat ignored the child and never looked back as he grunted and snorted and brought her through the stony corridors of the castle, past flaming torches and towering pillars. Soon they came upon another beastly ogre, standing guard at the entrance of a large chamber. This was Slag. His lower jaw jutted out with huge yellow teeth that curled up on either side of his nose. Katie stared at the thick, ugly beast that growled and watched her with great suspicion as she stumbled past and entered the dark hall. Rogad plodded forward, and once they were inside, he released the girl, snarled, then turned around and exited the chamber, slamming the heavy oak doors behind him. Katie rubbed her wrist as she backed away and found herself standing in a pool of light. When she turned around, Gelzuin was smiling down on her from atop his dark throne, while all around things waited in the shadows just beyond her view, strange shapes that were holding still, trying not to be noticed. As her eyes adjusted, she could start to see them. They were woodland creatures, large plumed peacocks, great horned deer, badgers and wolves, all gathered around, looking at her, blinking. Slowly, a little red bushy-tailed fox came forward and took a few steps into the light, then sniffed the air and quickly returned to the shadows. The animals looked on and waited patiently, as though they expected the child to say something important. Soon other things began to emerge, creatures that moved among the animals. They were little people, dwarves and elves, that pointed and watched and could hardly stand still, while behind them stood the darker creatures. These were worst of all, and Katie tried not to look at them. There were ogres and goblins, imps, urchins, frightful creatures like lizard monkeys, winged jackals, and other nameless things that only lived in nightmares. Most of them tended to stay in the shadows where they belonged, but Katie could hear them grunting and snorting, chattering among themselves, filled with curiosity. Suddenly there was something hurrying out of the shadows, but before Katie could scream, the hideous hook-nosed goblin scampered up, pointed his bony finger at her, and laughed. Ha! He jeered with great satisfaction, then quickly made his way up the throne steps and perched himself next to the wizard like a vulture. Numlock peered down at Katie and grinned. He was happy to be back in the Nor world, and anxious to see what would become of the little girl now that she was without her precious guardian. Another noise echoed from out of the darkness and distracted Katie from the ugly little creature. There were heavy footsteps and the sound of long claws scraping the stone floor. Katie backed away, her eyes growing wider as she watched the huge beast lumbering out of the darkness. Beware the great brown bear, the chipmunk had said, and the warning echoed in her mind. The animal walked into the light and Katie froze. The bear was truly massive. His head alone was bigger than she was. His legs were the size of tree trunks. His barrel-shaped body was well over a thousand pounds, and his fur glistened a deep, rich red that shone like auburn. The animal moved slowly as it came forward and looked right at the child with his golden-brown eyes. Katie wanted to faint. She wished she could faint, but she was too scared and unable to move. She feared the monstrous beast would gobble her up in one bite. But to Katie's absolute amazement, the great bear continued on and walked right past her. 
Katie stumbled as she forced her stiff legs to move so she could see where the beast was going. She watched the bear mount the first few steps of the throne, then sit down at the wizard's feet. When Katie had calmed herself, her first thought was that the animal was the wizard's pet. But she began to think otherwise when the great bear sat up, leaned forward, and rubbed its chin as though it were studying her quite carefully. Katie stared back in utter disbelief. Then, as if that weren't surprising enough, the enormous beast opened its mouth and spoke. A child of God, he said in a deep rumbling voice and shook his head. There was a gasp from the shadows as though this was a terrible development. Calm yourself, my dear Bromwyn. All is well, I assure you, the wizard said as if to dismiss the animal with a word. The bear growled as he climbed down from the steps of the throne that was once his, then slowly walked around the child to observe her. With his chest out and his head held high, Katie could see he was indeed a king. He stood in front of her and gave a disapproving glance down at her bunny slippers, which were a little ragged, but smiled up at Bromwyn with their usual pleasant grin. Katie looked at the bear in horror. They're not real, I promise. They're just my slippers, she said, and wiggled her toes to prove it. The bunny slippers nodded as if to say it was true and no harm done. The bear huffed, and Katie breathed a sigh of relief when he turned away to face the wizard. Bromwyn growled loud enough for everyone in the great chamber to hear. All is not well, wizard, Bromwyn said. She is a child of God, a bearer of light. You had no right to bring her here. Gelzuin peered down from his throne. Do not forget who is in charge, dear Bromwyn. I will tell you when you are in danger and when you are not, he said. Bromwyn growled back. How did you do it? He demanded, but the wizard only smiled and seemed to enjoy the growing sense of confusion that surrounded the child in her arrival. Bromwyn turned to Katie once more. Do you know where you are, child? He asked in a voice so deep Katie could feel it grumbling inside of her. No, sir, but I'd like to go home now, if I may, Katie said. Bromwyn stepped closer and looked her in the eyes. This is the Nor world, he said. The middle kingdom between the moon and the stars, past the cities of Jasper and Gold, beyond the earthly realm of slumber, but near to your dreams. The bear looked on with a curious gaze, and Katie just stared. She had no idea how to respond, or even if she should. The wizard smirked at her charming innocence and Bromwyn sighed. Mm. Indeed, you are innocent. The heavenly spheres are beyond your concern. Yet here you are. So how did you get here? How did you come to be in our world? The bear said, wondering aloud. Katie understood very little, except for the last question. I came through the door. My door? The bear looked at her questioningly. I mean, the side of my door? She added, trying to be helpful, but there was no reaction until she said, It was a traveling spell. The bear growled once again, and Katie could feel the sound of it go right through her. Bromwyn turned to face Gelzuin and bared his fangs at the wizard. <laughs> More of your evil magic to defy the law. You bridge the gap between worlds and bring God's wrath upon us all. What I do is no concern of yours, Gelzuin answered, and sat back casually admiring one of the larger rings on his fingers. I will use my magic as I see fit. Bromwyn glared at the wizard. You have taken my throne and cast your spell of fear over my people. 
You do not frighten me, wizard. The fact remains. You have taken a child of God and placed her in harm's way. In doing so, you have angered the Almighty and will surely pay. The wizard raised an eyebrow and stared at the bear with an intensity that would have made any lesser creature wilt away. But Bromwyn was not done. Katie backed away from the ferocious power of the animal. Mark my words, wizard. As sure as I stand here before you, I... The bear's words ceased abruptly and the hall fell silent. Katie watched as every living creature pulled back into the shadows and waited for Bromwyn to continue. When he didn't, she finally looked to see what was wrong and gasped. The great brown bear had turned to stone.